Um, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. If this is the North State, I come from the South State, beautiful Imperial County, Western Eastern Riverside County. Uh, don't visit in August. It's like 120 degrees, um, but it's great to be here. I, I appreciate it. So I'm here with the, uh, the Western Region CCA. I'm the, the board chair, and there's a number of us here that'll be on the panels. We are the largest group of certified crop advisors in the whole program. There's about 1,400 of us uh, running around Arizona, Hawaii, and California. I don't think we're all here today, but we're working on that. Um, but we're here to, to talk about Soils 101, and then you'll see a number of, of, of other panelists that are going to talk about their subject and expertise. And really what I want to underscore is if you're interested in the soil health, if you're interested in regenerative ag, there's a lot of great advice out there, and that certified crop advisor can be a, a key person in your operation to help you get going. If you need a nice fancy pen, we do have a booth over there. Uh, come by, come chat with us, we'll hook you up. So I'm going to talk about Soils 101, and uh, really it starts with what is soil. I know sometimes folks get mad if you call it dirt. I don't, I don't really have that argument. You call it dirt, call it soil. Let's get, really get into it. This is the definition from the, from the USDA and the NRCS website. It's the stuff on top of the, uh, the, of the, the earth's surface where we grow plants, right? And that's, that's the hard part about soil, and that's the fun part about soil. Because if you really look into what soil is, soil is unique because it has all three phases in it all at once. There's a solid phase, there's a liquid phase, and there's a gas phase super unique. There's not many things on the planet that exist in all three phases at once, but lucky for us, soil has that. So one piece that we're learning as we move through our agricultural processes and we face new challenges is that soils can be managed very precisely, and I'll walk you through some of those management practices, but I also want to show you things that you might consider measuring as you make practice changes, and there's several booths around here where you can go chat with people what's about practice changes appropriate to your farm or ranch. And so measuring these things is important. And so I'll talk about that and kind of put it in this context of, of Soils 101. So this is uh, the, the three spheres of managing soil. Physical management, chemical management, and biological management. In case you were wondering, this is, this is not Imperial County soil. Um, that is, those are not my hands. But uh, I'll walk through some of these, these uh, measurements that you can consider putting into your program as you chat with these different folks here and, and implement new practices. Things you can measure, because if you can measure it, you can manage it, right? So I'll start with the physical, walk through the chemical management, and then go through the biological. The biological piece is the new one on the block. That's the one that has everyone excited talking about it. We're still kind of figuring out where to send our soil samples to and how to get these things measured, but I'll walk you through some key parameters. But I really want to underscore this advice part. You're not alone. Uh, you know, like was mentioned earlier, there's a lot of, of expertise out there. So if you're considering making some sampling changes, you know, chat with, chat with your, your favorite crop advisor and they can set you straight. So on the physical part, a couple of things worth talking about. Aggregate stability. How well does your soil structure hold together? If you take a shovel and your soil looks like cake batter, that, that's a soil with poor structure. If you have to, when you go to take that sample, you've got to hit the shovel with your truck hitch. You know, raise your hand if that's been you before. Um, I've certainly had to go do that. But if you have poor structure and you start making changes, whether it's cover crops, reducing your tillage, there's a laundry list of, of practices you can make. You can measure the change in your aggregate stability, the changes in your physical structure. So there's labs that can walk you through that and, and how to take those samples. Another piece is soil compaction. With all the vehicle traffic our fields get with permanent cropping systems, and even some of these quasi-permanent cropping systems like alfalfa, uh, compaction is a big deal. And so you can buy some tools off the internet called penetrometers, and you can actually measure changes in how much pressure it takes to go to different depths in your soil and keep track of that, that penetrometer PSI change over time. So not very expensive. Uh, the old school way is to get a big long screwdriver in the shop and use that as your penetrometer. You just don't get the nice reading at the end of the day. It's either that was easier or that was hard. But a, a nice way to investigate the physical uh, parameters of your soil. Another couple ones, and this is, I think is important for this year, it was around water storage. Well-structured soils, so soils that I mentioned earlier that have that aggregate stability, 
well-structured soils can store more water. They can receive more water in from rainfall and from irrigation events, and they can store more water around the pores itself and in the pore space. So you can actually measure changes in your soil's ability to store that water, and that's called available water capacity or water holding capacity, depending on the lab you go to. But there's labs that can do that. As you make these practice changes, measure your soil's change in its ability to store water. And then finally, the NRCS is here. They have a great kit and great set of instructions for measuring how fast can you get the water into your soils. So that's called a, 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 ring, a ring test, so your water infiltration rate. How much volume of water per minute can you get in? And you can really use those ring tests to, to tune your irrigation sets so you're not overloading the soil, promoting runoff, and you can actually improve that ring test measurement, more water per unit time as your soil health improves. I'll talk about the chemical measurements, and I won't go through all of them, but this is really the greatest hits of what we've been working with. This is, this is what we've seen on soil reports, and this is a, an actual real, real soil report. Like it's from the desert, you know, low organic matter, high pH. Uh, you know, it's the, t the typical stuff we deal with out west. But this has more information on it that we're used to seeing, that we're used to managing the chemical piece. Here we have the phosphorus parts per million, potassium parts per million. Uh, if you're from areas with bad salinity issues, has all the salinity information so you could write management programs. This is a piece that we're, we're used to and our industry has, has really excelled on this chemical management. So you can write prescriptions from here. You can write remedies from a nutrient deficiency to a toxicity to, uh, to and correcting and remediating uh, fields that have been impacted by salts. So lots of great information on here and lots of opportunity to really fine-tune those fertilizer programs you have going out. One piece that's missing, and this has been a struggle as growers have wanted to move into some of this biological management, a typical soil test doesn't show you anything about how alive the soils are. Really, we have one metric to help out, that organic matter, the, the soil carbon, but really, we, in most of our practices, we, we don't have enough information to make that determination. And that's where these new practices are coming. And that's this biological measurements. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention a couple of biological measurements, and uh, if you wanna write them down, so you can call up your favorite CCA or your favorite lab and say, hey, I want that test, so you can, uh, you can uh, order it. But this, the industry, the lab industry, is still catching up to the biological piece. Uh, if you want to chat with me more about this, this type of measurements, I'll, I'll be over at the, the CCA booth here later on, and I can help you out, find some resources. But some important biological measurements, soil protein. So this soil protein test is measuring how much your microbial system, you know, those fungi and those bacteria, how much nitrogen are they helping to mineralize that will become available to the plant. So if you have a lot of life in your soil, they'll be producing a soil with higher soil protein. So it's a great way to integrate your living component of your soil in with some of that nitrogen cycling, that chemical cycling of your soil. Another great measurement is active carbon. This sounds like some sort of energy drink that you, you, you drink at a frat party or something, but active carbon, that's, uh, that's a measurement of how much food is in your soil. How, how ready, readily available is a meal for your microbes to eat? You can actually keep track of that, and as you make practice changes, keep track of those foodstuffs. How well fed are my microbes? So soil protein, active carbon, a couple more important ones. And these are the, this is probably the most folks' introduction to the biological measurements, and you're measuring respiration. How much CO2 is your soil producing? And from there you can infer how, my, uh, how, how active are the microbes in your soil. So the more CO2 coming off the ground, the more active your, your microbes are uh, by indirect measurement. So there's two flavors of this test. There's the Haney test, and some labs do offer that here in, in California. And this is a couple of different methods all put into one. You have the CO2 coming up uh, for, to measure the microbial activity, and then you have a couple of measurements of nutrients and potentially mineralizable nitrogen. So you can take one test and measure a couple of different things, super useful. The other piece is the Solvita burst test. This is the one that really kind of kick-started this biological measurement across farm country globally. And this is measuring just the CO2. Uh, it's a 24-hour CO2 soil respiration test. The higher that CO2 coming off the ground, the more microbes that are active. So you can measure that. If you make practice changes, 
you can measure your microbes in one, you know, at one uh, year, and then come back the next year and measure it and see how, see how uh, active your microbial community is. If you want to spend a lot of money, you can, get, you can get labs to do direct counts of the microbes. I don't recommend doing that. It takes a long time, and then they just give you a number per unit gram of soil. It takes forever. Um, I would stick with those CO2 burst tests because you get a readily available interpretation. So one piece that holistic management produces is soil health. So make, turning your soil from its current state into a much healthier state, or we can also call it a regenerated state. And that's what, depending on who you talk to, they use different terminology. So by integrating these three components, you can turn your fields and put them on a different trajectory for managing stress and, and, and challenges. Because healthy soils do a lot of great things. Healthy soils store water. I mentioned that aggregation piece. If you have better soil structure, you can store more water. Healthy soils help resist erosion. That's a big deal in the Midwest. Healthy soils also sequester carbon. That's a whole other talk, but healthy soils can start put some more carbon below ground, and that's become more popular here as we move forward with carbon markets. And then at the end of the day, there's a lot of research coming out, and if you're, if you're interested, there's the Soil Health Institute. They've just released a number of papers showing the economics of soil health that over and over again across different crops, different regions, so improving your soil health helps to improve your profitability at the end of the day, helps to optimize that land use. And I think for us, that's super important here, helps to optimize that land, that nutrient use as well, getting more work done per unit input. And I can't think of a better year in 2022 than to really think about that nitrogen use efficiency and fertilizer use efficiency. So lots of compelling reasons to push those different systems, that physical, biological, and chemical uh, components of your soil, make that soil better, and, uh, and, and really push that system to, to somewhere different. So the challenge is, is that our ag practices in the past have, have beat our soils up a little bit, tillage, lack of carbon inputs back into the soil. So we've really, we've, we're really kind of turning the page here, and you can feel the momentum changing that we're going we're gonna to start implementing different uh, practices to, to make the soil better. So I always, I always want to close with how to sample. And then I'll wrap this up, but if you can measure it, you can manage it, right? We've done a great job measuring the chemical nature of our soil. Lots of soil reports. Some of you probably have them floating around in the truck here. Every time you turn, they fall off the uh, dashboard. Yeah, I, I know who you are. Um, but if you can measure it, you can manage it. And so I'd say pick a spot, measure it annually. Could be spots in your field. Really try to dial down that spatial variability. This becomes important once you bring in that biological component to the soil. You'll need to keep good records to really standardize where you're sampling to keep track of those changes. I like to do the before and after, you know, go out now, establish a baseline, then start your practice changes so you can see how you improve your ground over time and how you can, you're making that system better. It's great psychologically to see those incremental improvements because uh, watching the soil, just staring at it, not as much fun. You put a little bit of data behind it, that becomes a lot more lively. And then, of course, observations. What, is, what, are, what are the soil health components of your best field? What do they look like compared to the field that you really struggle with? Take some comparisons and, say, and set your own internal benchmark to, to, to set the performance metrics. And then I want to just close on this last slide. If you're going to sample the biology, there is some considerations for how sensitive microbes are to some of this spatial diversity and temporal diversity. If you're going to sample your microbes, this time of year, going into late May, is a great time to do it because you really are tracking that early flush of microbes. You're not waiting till August when it's super hot outside. You're really, you're really uh, tracking that early flush so you can get good counts. The other piece we have to think about is where we're sampling and how deep. Here's the nice thing about soil biology. You don't need to go dig a three-foot hole to find microbes unless you really want to. I wouldn't do it. You really just need that standard six, eight inch sample that we all like to do. That's where the majority of your biology is going to be. So don't dig too deep unless you're trying to haze your interns or something. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that either, just for, on the record, because I'm on video. Uh, and I'd also do it as close to your emitters as possible, because that's where your biology is going to be concentrated. If you take your samples way out in the, in the lane or the alley, you're not going to have as much biology. So six inch, eight inch depth, right by the emitter, and try to do it here 
late spring, early summer, and you'll be all set. And also my final, uh, my final piece is don't let that sample just roll around in the truck for a week before you send it in. Try to get it in as soon as you can within 24 hours to keep that biology viable and so you get the best measurement possible. And so I, as I've, I've uh, included some, some measurements for you to write down, just sort of thinking, what am, I, what am I missing here? Where can I improve? And if you need some advice, certified crop advisors are certainly here to, to help you out. And there's a big community of, of folks all pushing for improved soil health, better metrics to measure it, and uh, we can get you going and, and get you on the right path. Thank you. Question in the front. Regarding soil health microbial activity, a lot of systems common up here are the Nelson rotators or mini sprinklers with cover crop in the middle, herbicide treated burns. So in that system, and you've got a, you've got a mature orchard. I'm assuming your sampling for biological activity would be more effective where you have cover. That's right, yeah. If, if you're looking for the living component of your soil, cover is very important. So if you sample that in that wetted area from the sprinkler that's also covered, that's where you'll find that the best counts. If you go out to where it's not covered, no water, it'll be very hard to track a signal uh, in your field because it'll, they'll be scant. Uh, scant microbes they don't like to live where it's hot and dry good question yeah great question so the question is how do you recover the soil health after you've treated with an herbicide or some other chemistry and there are growers out there experimenting say with uh, a fumigation where they, they fumigate to control the pathogens but then they come back with an active soil health management program and that's where some of these practice changes can come into place really tailoring it to your operation to help fit it and then having those metrics behind it to show like, I know I'm adding this chemistry to control something, but I'm, then I'm coming back with a practice change and here's the results of my, say my CO2 burst test showing that I do indeed am pushing for higher, higher microbial activity despite my, my needed practice to control weeds or, or, or other pathogens. Yeah, so it really, it's, it's all about customizing it to your operation, but there are ways around some of these, uh, these practices that we have. Great question. Yeah, yeah. So there's a there's a test out there called uh, microbiometer. Um, I I've used them. It's a it's a useful tool. Uh, an index in the field, you know, because you can bring it uh, the soil sample out with you. If you if you have a phone, look up micro microbiometer, uh, spelled exactly like I said it, and you can actually use a take a sample, do it in the field, and actually use your phone to calculate the measurement. So it's a nice way to sort of index your performance. If you want a little more granularity and, 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 and to reproduce your results more formally, say for a, a, a formal documentation, I would recommend going to a lab for some of those measurements. But it's a good tool in the field. Good question. So the, the question is how do you measure soil health when you have two very contrasting parts of your field? You have the parts under the trees and the parts in the middles. I would sample separately, sample my, my berms where all the activity is, and then and ke and keep those samples separate so you can, met, you can track that over time. And if you're interested in the, in, the, in, the, in the space in between, have them assigned to their own sampling scheme. So I've just doubled your sampling efforts, but you're only going to eight inches, so you're not having to dig a three-foot hole in both. So I would, I would keep those separate spatially to help manage that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Do you want me to sit here? Uh, it's up to you. It's going to be video now.